Well, you know, I like what Solomon said. He says, above all else, guard your heart, for out of it flows the issues of life. You know, I, when I see someone with issues, I realize that they have failed to guard their heart. And I can relate to them because I had lots of issues, especially in my miserable middle school years. I remember being 13, 14 years old, and I was super depressed. Like a wet, heavy blanket was over me, and I had a hard time finding joy in any way in my life. I went to substances to try to pacify my anxiety and panic attacks. I uh, started cutting myself. Uh, It's called non-suicidal self-injurious behavior. Um, Sometimes I would burn myself. I didn't have very many friends, you know, and I didn't, uh, I didn't, I wasn't great at school. My grades were failing, and I felt like a loser. And uh, and I'm I'm so thankful that God brought a wise voice into my life, Grandma, Grandma Jody. She was uh, old (laughs) and sometimes wise and sometimes didn't make sense to me. But she took one look at me as that, 14-year-old, she says, Sonny, why are you so sad? She called me Sonny because I think she forgot my name. (laughs) I said, Grandma, I'm sad, okay, because like kids at school are like mean to me. She says, oh, that's sad. I said, yeah, they really hurt my feelings. She says, no, they don't. You hurt your own feelings. I'm like, Grandma, what are you talking about? They make me angry. She says, you anger yourself. (laughs) I said, Grandma, if you met these people, you know they're annoying. They push my buttons. You're annoying. You push your own buttons. I'm like, Grandma, we're going to put you in a home. (laughs) You're not making any sense, okay? And I won't visit at all. She just laughed. (laughs) And then she asked me the weirdest question. It was so shocking, I never will forget it for the rest of my life. She said, Sonny, if you beat me with a stick, would that break my bones? I'm like, Grandma, that is a terrible thought. All right, your bones are like hyper brittle. You would die. She said, that's right. If you hit me with a stick, my bones would break. But let's say you called me a mean word. Would that break my bones? I said, no, Grandma, they're they're just words. She said, would your hateful words bruise my skin? I'm like, well, your skin is kind of (laughs) thin. But no, it would hurt your feelings. She said, no, it wouldn't. I said, Grandma, if I cussed you out, you'd cry. She said, impossible. (laughs) I said, how can you, a little old lady, be so strong? She says, Sonny, it's easy to hurt my body. All you need is a stick or a stone, but it's just about impossible to hurt my feelings. I'm the boss of my feelings, and I decided a long time ago that no one can hurt my feelings without my permission. She quoted Eleanor Roosevelt. No one can make you feel inferior without your permission. For the first time in my life, someone explained to me how emotions work. Someone explained that it's the thoughts of my mind that determine the feelings of my heart. And if I want to protect myself from a broken heart, I need to control the thoughts of my mind. The way she put it so beautifully was, if you want to break my heart, you got to go through my mind first. Hmm. If we don't learn how to guard our heart, protect our emotions from the inevitable disappointments in life, depression, anxiety, Feelings of despair will threaten to ruin our lives. You know, many, many years later, she ended up in an assisted living facility. And I, of course, visited her. I love my grandmother. And she had suffered from a stroke, part, partly uh, paralyzed. She was living in uh, relative obscurity. I went into her room where she was spending most every day. I said, Grandma Jody. She said, Sonny. I said, why are you alone? She says, I'm not alone. God's with me. I said, yeah, but how are they treating you here? She says, well, they, they, they keep giving me lemons and I just make lemonade. I thought, I have got to marry a woman just like my grandma, preferably younger. But man, emotional resilience looks good on you, doesn't it? Grit is gorgeous. Let's look to Scripture to see what God says in a message entitled, Healing the Hurting Heart. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 45. I want to teach you how to protect yourself from the needless suffering 
that might come with persecution or difficult days. I wanna teach you how to enjoy the life you have and not the one you wish you had. I wanna teach you how to be emotionally strong. And it's straight up from God's word. In this passage, we read the emotional journey of a guy named Baruch. I love his name because it's how Latinos say my name. Hola, Baruch. I'm like, no, it's Brooks. Baruch. I mean, that's fine. I love Baruch because when I read his name, I think of me. And when I read his suffering, I can relate to it. Maybe you can too. In Jeremiah chapter 45, God speaks to Baruch through the prophet Jeremiah, verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he had written these words in a book at the instruction of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of God of Israel to you, O Baruch. You say, Woe is me now, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I have no rest. Thus you shall say to him, Thus says the Lord, behold, what I have built, I will break down. What I have planted, I will pluck up. That is this whole land. And do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord. But I will give your life to you as a prize in all places wherever you go. Who was Baruch? And why was he suffering so much? Baruch was the scribe for Jeremiah who took pride in his work. He cared a lot about it, and he was good at it. He wrote down whatever Jeremiah would say, and that was the oracles of God, so he became a master penman, and he knew that his writings had the potential to reach the king's desk, and if the king would read it and would be convinced of the message, the king could make a decision for the whole nation to repent, and the blessing of God would be poured out. He took his job serious, and he had a love, a deep love for his country. He was a patriot, a wonderful man. And yet, his story is told in Jeremiah chapter 36 that things did not go so well for him. Jeremiah told him what to write, and he wrote it down. Jeremiah said, I'm confined, I can't go, but can you go to where the king is and read this out in the open square? Maybe the scribes will hear it. The king scribes, and maybe they'll bring him before the king. And who knows, maybe the king will listen to this rebuke, and he'll turn, and the Lord will spare the southern tribes of Israel, known as Judah. So Jeremiah prayed and, and sent Baruch off with his scroll and the best writing he ever did in his life. And on this time of fasting, when the people of God were gathering, asking for God's blessing, although the king and the king's people were in rebellion and wanted to nothing, do nothing with God, the people were still hopeful when they heard the rebuke and the challenge by God through the prophet Jeremiah, written by Baruch, to repent, lest destruction come on the southern tribes of Israel. Oh, man. They said, please, please, you've got to show it to the king's scribes. So the king's scribes came out and said, what's all this fuss about? And they listened to it, and they say, who wrote that? And he said, well, I wrote it down, but God spoke to Jeremiah the prophet, and I just wrote it down with ink. Can you take it to the king? And they said, you go hide over here. We'll bring it to the king. We hope he hears it. And they brought it to the king, and this is what happened. You can look just a few pages over in Jeremiah chapter 36. It says it starting in verse 20. And they went to the king into the court, but they stored the scroll in the chamber of Elishama, the scribe, and they told all the words in the hearing of the king. And so the king sent Jehudi to bring the scroll, and he took it from Elishama, the scribe's chamber. And Jehudi read it in the hearing of the king and in the hearing of all the princes who stood beside the king. Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month, with a fire burning on the earth before him. And it happened when Jehudi had read three or four columns that the king cut it with the scribe's knife and cast it into the fire that was on the earth until all the scroll was consumed in the fire that was on the earth. Yet the king and his people, they were not afraid, nor did they tear their garments like they should have. The king nor any of his servants who heard all these words, but nevertheless, El Nathan, Deliah, and Gemariah implored the king, begged the king not to burn the scroll, but he would not listen to them. And the king commanded Jeremiel, the king's son, 
Sariah, the son of Ezreal, and Shelemiah, the son of Abdeel, to seize Baruch, the scribe, and Jeremiah, the prophet. But the Lord hid them. With this context, we understand now Jeremiah chapter 45. Three reasons why Baruch was emotionally miserable. Number one, his hard work was destroyed. It was his life's work. The Bible says a man's gift for him, will, will, the man's gift will make room for him and bring him before kings. We work hard on our, on our talent, on our acquired skills. We put the 10,000 hours in. It is our life's work. And to have your life's work ripped apart and burned like it's trash, that hurts. Have you ever built something only to have it taken from you and destroyed? Have you ever toiled, put everything you have into something only to have someone else disrespect it in the worst way? Maybe it was a career. You sacrificed so much and yet someone else ripped it apart. Maybe it's a marriage you cared and you tried to work to keep you and your spouse together, yet someone came in, usurped your influence and ripped apart the holy matrimony that God put together. Maybe it's your children, countless years, tears, and dollar bills, y'all. <laughs> and they leave you like you were nothing to them in their life. They can't think of one single good thing because the cognitive distortion, the thinking errors, the blindness of their victimization and their mindset that's so toxic, vaporized in a moment of rebellion. What about any investment you've ever had, you've worked your whole life for, and it vaporizes in a moment? You can relate to Baruch. You can understand what he's going through. The second reason why Baruch was miserable, and I can relate to him, is his beloved nation was being destroyed right before his eyes. Israel at that time was being led by a godless man whose strings were pulled by Nebuchadnezzar, which was globalism, truly, in the ancient world. See, Nebuchadnezzar had kidnapped this Jehoiakim three years earlier, and then they did a deal in Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar decided to send Jeho Jehoiakim back as long as, he, as Jehoiakim would always pay tribute back to Nebuchadnezzar. And that's exactly what Jehoiakim did. He didn't even have the luxury to listen to God because he was bought. He was played. And so his ears were stopped, his hands were tied, and he was hell bent on doing whatever a godless globalist would tell him to do. Does that sound familiar? when our leaders are hell-bent on blocking every truth seeker and silencing every truth speaker. Today, in the Western world, our fake fact-checking cancel culture that seeks to silence biblical truth, it sounds a lot like every Western nation on earth these days, including America. And does your heart ache for this great nation? Can you relate to the sadness of Baruch as he watched the godless dominate and the godly retreat? The third reason why Baruch was miserable was because his life was threatened to be destroyed. Because of death threats, Baruch had to go into hiding and the Lord helped him. Do you think persecution could happen to us today? In this great nation, do you think that we could be a target of the enemy? Without a doubt. And even the thought of persecution can bring depression and sadness and feelings of despair. But do you know something? The Christian looks at persecution differently. Jesus told us in the Beatitudes, he says, blessed are the persecuted. You should be exceedingly glad because great is your reward when you are persecuted for righteousness sake. I tell my kids, man, haters is how heaven hooks you up. Anytime someone mocks you because you are trying to rightly divide the word of truth and teach everyone the commands that Christ has instructed us to, anytime that you're rejected for standing up for righteousness, you are making deposits in the afterlife. You are storing up treasures in heaven. He rewards us greatly so we could actually be glad. We can lean into the slap on the cheek and turn it the other way and say, bring it. That's how our Lord Jesus was. 
Man, I would have loved to have seen Jesus. He must have been so awesome. The Bible says in Isaiah 50 that he set his face like flint, like a tip of an arrow. He didn't allow any persecution to hold him back, but he leaned in. He gave his back to be beaten and his beard to be plucked out. Bring it. That's the attitude we need to have, especially as we move towards these last days. So his hard work was destroyed. His beloved nation was destroyed and his life was threatened to be destroyed. So what is his emotional consequence to these activating events or circumstances? He loses his mind. Understandably, Baruch is broken hearted. In Jeremiah 45, we look back at that text and we see four symptoms of his emotional mem- misery. The first symptom, he said, is woe is me now, self-loathing, self-loathing. You ever feel sorry for yourself? Your life should have been better. You've been given a raw deal. Life should have turned out better than this. Oh, woe is me. You know, actually, that's, that self-loathing mentality is so damaging And I heard someone say, we need to teach people how to love themselves so they don't self-loathe. I said, no, they self-loathe because they love themselves. And this person said, that's not true. I said, yes, it is. The people that you love, you rejoice when things are good for them. And the people that you hate, you rejoice when things go bad for them. And so if something's going bad for you and you are self-loathing and crying and you feel bad, it means you love yourself. You adore yourself. You value yourself so much. Woe is me. We have to be careful with that. We don't hate ourselves. We actually love ourselves. And kids who cut, like I did in middle school, kids who have suicidal ideation, it's actually a form of self-preservation. You don't necessarily want your life to end, but you want the pain to stop. That's the driving factor of both non-suicidal and suicidal behavior. You want the pain to stop. It's actually a form of self-preservation. You love yourself so much, and that's why it becomes one of the most selfish acts a person can do, because you're not thinking of other people. You're putting yourself first. That's what self-loathing does. It's the ultimate form of selfishness. The second thing he said is, for the Lord has added grief to my sorrow. Now we have victim mindset that blames others. This is a very dangerous stage to be in. When you start blaming others, you're the reason why my life is miserable. You might blame God or the government. You might blame other people, but the point is the victim mindset is the most dangerous mindset on earth. The worst acts of violence are committed by people who feel like victims. And when they do their retaliatory acts, They do it with a strong feeling of justification. I have the right to react in this way because I've been wronged, and you wronged me. It's not not the mindset that the believer is to have. And Baruch understandably was hurting, but his flesh was taking him down the dark, dark, downward spiral of despair. Not only did he say, blame God for adding grief to his sorrow, but he said, I fainted in my sighing. Can you imagine sighing so much? <sighs> you take more carbon in than oxygen and you faint. You hyperventilate. This is a panic attack. If you've ever had one, you know what it's like. And they say in the literature, the fear of, the, the result of the panic attack is actually Anxiety about your anxiety. It's a double layer whammo. It's one thing to be like, oh no, I feel anxious. But it's another thing to say, I'm getting anxious about feeling anxious. And once you got that double stacked, it's like you're in this negative feedback loop where you can literally faint. I've seen it. Extremities go numb, lips go numb, tunnel vision starts to happen, heart starts to palpitate. You think you're having a heart attack. You believe even though it may not be true. You believe you're dying, and so you have all the emotional consequences of that belief system. And that's what he was going through. 
He was fainting in his sign. But the fourth and final symptom we get is that he says, and I find no rest. He was sleep deprived. Why do we get sleep deprived? Because of our overacting brain. We try to close the gap of what's called cognitive dissonance. This is happening, and why is it happening? And you try to build a bridge to close the gap of knowing why you're suffering and who's gonna do what. Like mental chess, like mental gymnastics, you're trying to think of every type of scenario and figure it out yourself. You know, God tells us to not lean on our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge him, and he will direct our paths. He calls us to a Sabbath life of rest, to not try to figure it all out. We're not wise enough to understand what's going on or how to fix it. I look at this list as a psychologist, and according to the list of symptoms, assuming they were pervasive and debilitating, Baruch could have very well been diagnosed with an anxiety disorder, a depressive mood disorder. He would qualify for professional help. There's no doubt about it. But regardless of the contributing factors, God speaks directly to the root cause of emotional suffering in his response to Baruch. Will you please listen to this? This is probably my favorite part. It is biblically based, psychologically sound, culturally relevant. And when the trifecta is combined of these three things, it is so potent and powerful for our time today. This is God's prescription for healing the hurting heart. This is his remedy to strengthen yourself to guard your heart. Listen to what he has to say to Baruch and ultimately to us this morning. It says there at verse four of Jeremiah 45, thus you shall say to him, speaking of Baruch, thus says the Lord, behold, what I have built, I will break down. What I have planted, I will pluck up. That is this whole land. And Baruch, do you seek great things for yourself? Stop it. Do not seek them. For behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh, says the Lord but I will give you your life to you as a prize in all places, wherever you go. Oh man, if you knew what I knew, and many of you do, you know this was loaded with application. God's prescription for healing the hurting heart, number one, is surrender to the sovereignty of God. Surrender to God's sovereignty. Look what he says right there. Behold, what I have built, I will break down, and what I have planted, I will pluck up. That is this whole land. In other words, I do what I want with my creation. You know, the Bible says in the book of James, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. We could be hanging on to material things so much, even our nation, the wonderful United States of America. We could be holding on to our church. We could be holding on to our liberty, to our freedoms. We could be holding on to it. God, you gave me this. Well, you know what Job said about that? He says, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord. If he gave it, he could take it away. We say, well, that's not nice. No, he's good, and everything he does is good. Just because you don't understand it doesn't mean it's not good. And that's what he's saying to Baruch right here. He's saying, man, behold, what I have built, I will break down, and what I have planted, I will pluck up. This whole land, by the way, this whole earth will be judged by fire. It will pass away, and he'll create a new heaven and a new earth, and the former things will be forgotten, nor will they even come to mind. And yet we hug this earth like It is our identity. Let God be God. I imagine if I could go to heaven and he had an office and I would enter that office, he would have a huge desk and on that desk would have his name right there on a plaque and it would say, God. (laughs) And the most amazing thing about that place of authority is that his name is also his position, his title. What do you do here? God. Wow. That's like a big deal. God, that means the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, the all knowing, the all powerful, the one that is everywhere, omnipresent. You are God. You have the plan from the beginning. Oh God, let me let you be God and not give you my opinion of what I think you should do with America. (laughs) 
the second prescription here. He says, well, give up your grandiosity. Please listen to this. Give up your grandiosity. He says, and do you seek great things for yourself? Do not seek them, for behold, I will bring adversity on all flesh. It is not what happens to us that disturbs us, but our interpretation of what happens to us that causes disturbance. Here's how I explain it to kids. And if kids can get it in third grade, you can too. <laughs> Dr. Albert Ellis gave the ABC theory of emotions, and it's amazing. Everyone in this room say A. A. B. 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 C. C. A stands for the activating event. Something really bad happens to you, an adversity, or someone says something really mean to you, an adversary, I don't like you. That's A, the activating event. And right after A, zoom, C is triggered, which stands for your emotional consequence. Ah! Oh, that hurts my feelings. And it happens so fast. Ba -ba 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 -ba. For you drummers, that's called the flam. Ba -ba 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 -ba. It happens so fast. We are convinced A caused C. They hurt my feelings. I'm miserable because that happened. But do you know you'd be wrong? There is not a shred of scientific evidence in the social sciences that can prove or make a direct connection to the activating events in your emotional consequence. There can't be. In other words, you can never say again, they hurt your feelings. They made you angry. They upset you. They pushed my buttons. Y'all, there's no button. <laughs> there's no anger app that you can download and Bluetooth to somebody's brain and say, <laughs> And all of a sudden, they're like, oh my gosh, I'm all of a sudden flooded with feelings of anger. Who's on my frequency? Stop it. <laughs> for A to influence C, it has to go through what letter? B, and that stands for your belief system. What does Jesus care so much about? Our belief. Blessed are you who believe yet do not see. It's not what happens to you that bothers you, but what you believe about what happens to you. Now, let me show you something with the full body. This is some of our belief system. That must not happen. You better not say that again. How dare you? Look how rigid my arms are. Look how stiff I am. The same psychological elements that are in a temper tantrum two-year-old toddler are also in us when we don't get our way. And the more demanding we are, the more disturbed we will be. And we could have demands on ourselves. I must perform perfectly well and receive a, approval from important people. Do you like me? Do you like me? Do you like me? Or I'm inadequate and I can't be inadequate. I must not. We could have demands towards others. You must be fair and don't block my goals or you deserve punishment. We could have retaliatory feelings based on our rigid demands. We could have demands about life. Life must be comfortable and turn out how I envisioned or it's unbearable. And those roots to our irrational demands are the reason why we have disturbance. Do you know you are never angry unless you're demanding something? The only reason why you're upset ever is because you have a rigid demand. That's why counseling Biblical pastoral counseling does not focus on the activating event. What happened? It's not focused on the emotional consequence. How do you feel? <laughs> it's focused on belief. You cure the belief. You cure the, you cure the symptoms. The higher your expectations, the harder the fall. And my expectations are so low for people I am pleasantly surprised when they're nice to me. <laughs> because blessed are the flexible, they shall not break. Amen? <laughs> but the final thing is, of course, we're talking about surrender to God's sovereignty, give up your grandiosity, but enjoy God's generosity. He says, I will give you your life to you as a prize wherever you go. You know, God has given you life, that's a blessing, and he's given you, believers in Christ, eternal life. And if that's the only two things you have and you have no other blessings from his hand, that's enough to praise him for eternity. 
if you could just open your eyes to the blessings around. A lady told me last night, she says, I don't know, man, I'm just so irritable all the time. I said, why? She says, even the birds chirping. I'm just so irritated. I said, it's not the birds chirping that are irritating you. It's your thoughts about the birds that are irritating you. You can't be irritated unless you're irritable. You can't be annoyed unless you're annoyable. And I know what this is like. My son would always dehydrate himself every day, and by the end of the day, he was going, duh, 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 duh. and I was like, oh, it's so gross. Stop it. But I changed my belief about it. He's getting hydrated. That's music to my ears. And now I, I love hearing him gulp like a slob. I was so committed to find a girl to marry who had this resilient spirit, I spotted it a mile away. And I live with this wonderful, godly, blonde Christian babe. <laughs> For 22 years, I have watched her suffer tremendously because of disability and yet never complain. Her verses are, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Her verses are, for this light affliction is just for a moment and working in me a far exceeding eternal weight of glory. Her verses are, I consider the sufferings of this present time not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in me. She says, yeah, I may be hard pressed, but I'm not crushed. She loves the verses that point out the resiliency, the grit. I want you to watch this video as I honor her. When my wife was uh, born, she was gifted with an incredibly strong body. They realized in, uh, when she was three years old that she had unusual strength and she had amazing flexibility. They immediately put her in gymnastics and for 11 years, she was a star. And she was working on this one routine, a double backflip, and she just has to get enough speed, enough lift. Well, she got a bad bounce. She landed on her neck like a diver lands into a pool. She became quadriplegic in a snap. All her potential, gone. And as she lay there now, a prisoner in her own body, her family grieving around her, She had this remarkable joy. And as the months and even years went by and her gymnastics friends went elsewhere, she still had joy. But I remember looking at her for the first time, I thought, man, why is such a pretty girl in a wheelchair? That's the first thing I thought. And the second thing I thought is, I think this is my wife. Ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom, ba -boom. She just had this heart that beamed as bright as the sun. And I remember thinking, wow. So I asked her, gosh, it's a really bummer you're in a wheelchair. She says, it's not that bad. I said, no, it's really bad. Like, she says, no, I get great parking, you know. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. She says, yeah, I get on the front of roller coasters. I, you should definitely go to Disney World with me. She says, I, I'll get you right at the front of the line. I said, that's kind of like the upside to the letdown. You, you see the good and the bad. She says, I have to. I remember thinking, should I really marry her? This chair is going to be there in my life forever. I mean, it's a real hardship. Thank God I had the wisdom at 19 years old to have the same mentality she had. I love this girl. She is the best mother to my two boys. She homeschools them and has given them a love for learning and a love for God. She cares for our home and makes it beautiful. For 20 years, she's managed all of my bookings and she balances our household budget. I wouldn't know what to do without her. She takes care of her body and she suffers through chronic pain without complaint. After 25 years of being in that chair, she's defied paralysis and fights every day to walk again. And even if she doesn't, she still has joy. She's the love of my life, my common sense counselor, my lifelong friend. I love this girl. She just happens to be sitting all the time. It's her heart that matters. Where else am I going to find a girl like this? Are you kidding? I love this chair. Why? Because it's a, it's a repellent for shallow dudes. That's what the chair is.
Her chair is a repellent for shallow dudes that don't see the treasure that's sitting down. My wife will tell you that the only source of strength is in her personal relationship with the Lord Jesus. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own and the joy that we share as we tarry there is like none has ever known. See, she has a true husband and that's the Lord Jesus. And as her relationship with him grows, she just becomes stronger and stronger. So blessed when we live this abundant life when we solidify our belief in who God is and what he says we are, accepted unconditionally, loved completely. We grow in confidence, we grow in strength. And to live, it becomes Christ. And to die, we say, hey, that's gain. And you could have that. No temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to man. We all struggle in different ways, but ultimately it's the same. And the remedy is Jesus, a relationship with him. You know, he suffered for you in seven places. He bled around his head with a crown of thorns. If you have thoughts that are so debilitating, he bled for that. In his hands, he was pierced. If your hands have ever caused you to sin or you've hurt anybody with your hands, he covers that. Your feet, if your feet have ever taken you somewhere that you shouldn't have gone, if you've stepped on people out of your own insecurity and attempted to dominate them at their expense, his blood covers that. He was pierced in his feet. Well, you know, they put whip. They took a whip and they, they whipped his back. And if you ever feel like the weight of the world is on your shoulders, his blood covers that. And finally, they took a spear and jabbed it up his side. And he literally died of a broken heart. The water sack around his heart was broken and blood and water flowed out. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You think we don't have a high priest who can understand our suffering? The Bible says he was a man acquainted with grief, a man of suffering, and yet he was anointed with gladness above all his companions. Oh, we can hurt. And like the psalmist says, the bones that you have broken, may they become voices of praise. Will you stand to your feet and let's sing in faith our belief in Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white snow. your heart today and you may be ready to turn a corner in your relationship with Christ. That could be as a Christian or it could be as someone who's beginning to understand what it means to have a relationship with Christ. Our pastors will be up after the services if you have any questions that you would like to ask as you continue your journey. Please pray with me and then we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the message out of your book, out of your words spoken through Brooks, to remind us that life is both good and difficult at times. And yet, Jesus Christ, you are there through it all. I pray that as we take these words to heart and move into our weeks, that we would remember it's our beliefs that determine our response to life. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.